Before I introduce you to my next guest today, I want to make sure that you're aware of two new resources to help you to increase your productivity, clarify your purpose, and improve your communication skills. The first one is our Facebook community called Leadership with Purpose. So it's a private community. So go to Facebook groups, search for Leadership with Purpose, and send a request to be invited into the group. There's a few questions for you to answer, and then live to have you a part of that community of other like-minded leaders. Our team is really excited about launching the Next Level Coaching Roadmap. It's a group coaching format. So highly recommend that you check that out and to get your questions answered. If you're a leader that's experiencing any of the following, this is definitely a group format that's going to help you break through to your next level within leadership and your career. So if you have any fear about moving to the next level in your leadership career, this is a group that you'll want to connect with. If you have loss of confidence, if you're kind of confused, like not knowing really how to tap into the hidden job market, if you have a desire to really to grow to the next level, this is definitely a group that you'll want to be able to, to connect with. If you want to know how to stay calm in a high stress environment, there's going to be strategies, tips, and resources, conversations all around how to develop um, skills to do just that. So if you want more information, head over to warrenwandling.com slash the next level coaching. And uh, in there on that page, you'll notice uh, more information about the coaching roadmap, but also there's a link for you to schedule a phone call with me so we can help um, really figure out if this is the right fit to helping you take your career to the next level. Okay, again, that's warrenwandling.com slash the next level coaching. Welcome back to another episode of How to Become an Obstacle Buster. I'm your host, Warren Wandling, the show that's dedicated helping leaders and entrepreneurs to overcome their obstacles, build resilience, and achieve success. And I have a great guest with me today to do just that, Lathan Kraft. Welcome to the show, Lathan. Warren, so great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I'm really, I'm actually really looking forward to our conversation today. Um, as, as a best-selling author, host of a nationally recognized podcast, and the founder of Made for Purpose, Tell us about your business. Yeah, so if I there, – there's a term in Japanese culture that's called ikigai, and I don't know if you're familiar with that, that term. But essentially, what it says is the core of the human, like what you are, what you love, all that idea. And essentially, what I really have a passion for is those who have been left out, those who don't fit the mold, those who – um, just in whatever capacity, corporate America, the church, whatever idea, um, those who are the black sheep, if you will, because I believe the black sheep are the story of gold. Well, I love that, um, that definition and the, the, I guess the heart, right. In reference to those that have been left out. Yeah. So what, what is the greatest obstacle your clients encounter? I think it's themselves. Um, I think it's the idea that they've bought a lie um, and they've believed a lie in both their conscious and subconscious that they're not enough in whatever capacity and that what they bring to the table is not enough of an offering for what they want it to be or what they want to do. Um, and so the biggest obstacle that every client I talk to in, in whatever capacity or business I'm talking to them through is themselves and they just don't realize it. Um, and it's the uncovering of who they actually are. And that's what that's what we get to the core of is who are you? And once you figure out who you are, then and only then can you make the impact that you're called to make. Wow, that's that is really interesting to be able to like pull back the curtain, if you will, and really expose that this inner secret, even if they don't reveal it, is they feel right. like they're not enough. Yeah. Yep. So is there a strategy that you use to help um, your clients then did it really to, dis to verbalize or help describe what that means to them of not being enough? Yeah, the strategy is um, one that kind of gives the, uh, the, the look, if you know what I mean, from business owners and the like. Um, but my strategy is let's start at the end. Let's reverse engineer uh, because some people are so confused as to who they actually are that they've forgotten that the only way to figure out who they are is to figure out who they want to be because who you want to be is found in who you are. And so a question that I ask clients who can't figure out 
who they are is if your funeral was next week, would you be satisfied? Would, would there be enough to be said about you, about your life, that you would be satisfied with, with your current situation? Because, or another question to that would be, what do you want said about you at your funeral? Because a lot of funerals that I've been to that I've heard about are full of generic statements. Oh, they were kind. Oh, they were this. But you didn't live your whole life just to be called kind. You, you, have, you, you have a passion and a dream that someone put the fire hydrant on and said it's not enough. And it, it, we have to go back to where that fire hydrant and the, the drowning of the dream was. And maybe the way to do that is to figure out what you actually want to be said about you when you can't speak for yourself. So where do you think that begins, that feeling or that limiting belief of not enough happens for most people? Um, it, it could, it's all from a person of influence, uh, whether they know they had influence in your life or, or, or not, or it could be childhood. Um, but essentially the way I like to talk about it is there's something written in your cave walls. There's something that about you that you, if, if your life was a cave, there's something written on the, on the walls of your cave that you didn't put there that somebody else put there for you and you've believed it to be true about you. And so maybe it was a dad or mom, maybe it was a, a first, first or second boss. Maybe it was a person in church you looked up to, whatever it may be, somebody wrote something on your wall that you believe to be gospel truth, if you will, about yourself. And therefore, because you gave that person a, 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 an influential position in your life, you believe that to be the voice of reason in your life. And it just takes a lot, a long time to uncover why that's not reality. Wow. That's interesting. I love that word picture with the cave, like yeah. people are writing on your wall. Uh, yeah. And then with when, once you discover what's on your wall, then you take your clients through a process to help um, whitewash the wall, if you will, or put new beliefs to be able to eliminate that feeling of not enough. What do you, Warren? You got my business plan down pat. Um, yes, that's exactly what I do. It's, it's a matter of we need to take – because there's something written on your wall that's unique to you. Whether you it's not a generalization. It's – so there's something that you believe you're not enough in based on something about yourself. So an example would be, I'm not enough because when I was in fifth grade, this happened, or I'm not enough because my first relationship ended this way, or I'm not enough. And so it's going back to that situation and rewriting on top of that situation, why you are enough based on your current reality. So because of who you are now, this is true as opposed to the the latter, which was what was written on the cave wall. Wow. Interesting. So what, what was a key strategy that contributed to your success as you built your business? Um, that's a fantastic question. I learned that my pain was not a timeout. Um, I love a that. Lot of your, people... your pain was not in timeout. Is that what you said? My pain was not a timeout. Yeah. Like a lot of people think when they're in a season of pain or when they're experiencing a type of pain, it's this grand cosmical timeout that, that they're not ready yet, or they're not the person yet, or because they're in pain and something about themselves, it's wrong. And I learned that my pain is actually pointing to my greater purpose and not the opposite. And so the, the, <laughs> like the, the biggest thing that I came to realization with is what I've experienced in my life is not just for experience sake, but for impact sake. What I've experienced oh, wow. in my life is, is not just because, you know, I'm, I was just given this situation and I was I had to walk through this season or whatever it may be. Everything in my life is intentional because I'm only here for 70 or 80 years in the grand scheme of eternity. Um, and so everything that happens, happens for a reason. There's nothing by accident. And therefore, what can I do about that? And how can I help those people who are going through similar, not, not the same because every situation is unique, but going through similar situations and, and walk through that season, as opposed to them feeling the same thing I felt for a long time, just this ER type, woe is me, um, I'm in pain, I'm, I'm at fault, whatever it may be. Yeah, that, I love that's a great strategy for our listeners just to identify those that might be experiencing that internal pain, whatever that might look like for them. Certainly yeah. in the last few years, 
now it's a few years, can we say that, since COVID started? And <laughs> that's hard to believe, right? Yeah. Um, but to be able to identify and to be more self-aware, like what that might be for them so they can use that same formula that you just shared with us. Yeah. Love it. So in, in your opinion, why do leaders need to know they are made for purpose? <laughs> um, that kind of goes back to what I've just said. I think that the sad reality of corporate America, and, and this is just me speaking from a master's in leadership degree, a master's in education degree, all those things. The sad reality is metrics run the day and the bottom line is, is the bottom line. And so you lose a lot of the human in the, in the grand cog of corporate America. And every human comes in to your workplace, to your organization with a story, um, with the perspective and with a passion. And the, the way you can use that employee, leader, whatever it may be, is to help them work in your work in their passion while working for your organization. Or if you're looking for a, um, or, or if you're trying to find a spot to land, you need to find an organization, which honestly, sadly, is few and far between. But my hope is that organizations will start to work in this way. I don't know if you know right now, but the top Google search right now on Twitter or on Google is, how do I resign from my job? Because people are trying to figure out We've lived in this pandemic world. I don't know why I'm feeling the way I feel. And the reason they want to resign is because they're not working in their purpose. They're not fulfilling their purpose. They're filling their boss's purpose. Um, and so bosses and organizations need to shift from the reality of thinking that it's all about the bottom line, thinking it's all about the human. And, and that's how you will flourish as an organization. So that's a really great insight because you've like, because there is that great, resignation that yep. we're going through right but so but someone can be either running um from something or to something so if they just resign and go to another position thinking that that's going to give them the fulfillment a yep. few years later they're going to be in the same place because they haven't identified their purpose of what what their true purpose is what's going to be fulfilling is that what you're saying absolutely i i think there's a lot of Unfortunately, a lot of people that are in this, and here's what differentiates my main purpose business and other things. A lot of businesses with this idea are capitalizing the great resignation and saying you should resign and start your own business and do your own thing. Like think of the Michael Hyatt to the world, right? Like uh -huh. um, you yes. resign and do your own thing. Whereas I'm saying, no, there's a reason the organization is there and you can contribute in the way that you were created to contribute. We just have to start thinking in the way that honors you and not the bottom line, because the bottom line is going to be fulfilled and, and <laughs> abundantly so when all of your employees are working in their passion and not for the, the bottom line. When people are in the organization and working in what, they're create, what they are passionate about, the numbers will work and speak for themselves. And so I, I want and I believe that you should stay. I think there, there's a reason why you are where you are. I don't think resignation is the answer. I think the answer is found in, and it may have to come from the top, it may have to come from the top of the organizational chart of saying we're going to shift our organization into a human perspective and not a factory perspective, not a corporate America perspective, but we're going to champion every story that we have here and we're going to be the business that's for our employees. And you'll, you'll become a place that people want to work at because they'll realize that they actually matter at your organization. They don't matter based on what they do. They matter based on who they are. So within, with that being said, obviously making an impact with employee engagement and really tapping into someone's purpose and utilizing their talents and skills within their organizations. If, if, if there's a, one of our listeners that's saying, yes, you know, they're running an organization, they see that need to make that shift. What's the first step that you would suggest to those leaders to start making that shift of really connecting with individual team members and leaders on their team? around their purpose? I think the first step um, is honesty and transparency and remorse. Um, because if you were to come to your organization and employees and say, hey, I'm going to shift this with no uh, personality or emotion behind it, they don't know the why. But if you come to your organization and your employees and say, hey, I'm really sorry that I haven't treated you like a human and I've been so focused on 
what the productions are and what, what we're actually doing and not who you are. And I want to shift that. That speaks volumes to your employees and your employee automatically feels their value tank is refilled through your apology. And so the first step is you as a, as what is seen in corporate America is almost inaccessible and unemotional and all these things, making that emotional transition and saying, Hey, I just want to say that I'm sorry. And I want, I want you to work when, and the, the stuff that you're really passionate about, because I think it can contribute a lot to our organization. I'm sorry. I've, I've, I've acted like you can. So I'm, I'm really curious. What is the importance and impact of hope for a leader? Um, our country is the antonym of hope right now. Um, and so if there was any quality a leader should have should be that of hope because people are attracted to hope, whether they would admit it or not, people want hope. They want to follow somebody that seems like hope, especially hope in the midst of hopeless situations. And so the, the impact or, or the importance of hope is you are telling your employees that you can walk through any season and you'll have their back in any season and they'll know that, that you will fight for them and that you are a champion for them. And you're not letting the outside forces affect how you lead internally. And so hope is such a magnet and it's so attractive that when our numbers or when we have a bad day, a lot of leaders can wear that on their, on their sleeve. Mm-hmm. But if you communicate radiant hope always, because my belief is people are only a heartbeat away from hope. It's not something you have to necessarily work as, as, as a timeline. It's a heartbeat away. And so if you communicate and lead from a stance of hope and saying, hey, we're going to get through this. And, and maybe internally you're freaking out and you're like, I don't know how we're going to get through this. But if you lead through it, in a way that communicates hope, people will do everything they can to fight for that because it's the complete antonym of the country. Well, I love that key word that you use, hope, because I, you're right, everyone can identify with that word and they're, yeah. they're kind of like drawn to it, like like to the light, like in reference to just, if I could just have a glimpse of hope and just knowing that someone else is on their side during the work days, that's going to make an impact personally and professionally, I would think. Yes. So my next question is typically I don't, we don't necessarily go deep in this, this area, but because of your background, I'm really wanted to ask this question to you. And, And for those listeners that don't come from a faith perspective, I don't want you to tune out here because, um, Lathan has a strong background with this next question that I'm going to ask. So make sure that you really listen. Um, how? So my question is this, that how do you reach out to leaders who are on the fence about church, have been hurt by the church, or have done damage to this church themselves? Uh, I think it's very easy for a lot of people who haven't experienced the type of pain of the, of the pain that you just described, Warren, to justify the pain away. Um, to give an excuse for the pain, to um, try to reason with the individual of why their pain may have been what the pain was. There's a viral Facebook photo going on right now that I absolutely hate, um, but it's a lot of my Christian friends love it and they, they share it and they tag me in it even, that says, I'm sorry the church hurt you. That wasn't the Jesus that was human. That doesn't excuse, that doesn't, that doesn't excuse the pain. That doesn't give reason for the pain that was caused. And the statistics are showing that many people, hundreds of thousands of people, no exaggeration, are being hurt daily by the church, especially in the times where they're living in America right now, where the church is silent on things that they should be very vocal about. Um, and so how do you reach out to a leader who hurts on the fence? Um, the Bible I read says that we should be uh, quick to listen, slow to speak. Um, so I, I, I reach out to them in a way that I let their narrative run the conversation. I'm not trying to interject myself in the narrative and say, oh, oh what, what about this? Have you thought about it in this way? What about this? Instead, I, I, the, the Jesus I follow I never tried to justify, never tried to um, excuse away, always sat in the mess with people and the hurt and the pain. Um, and what's really funny is there's a, a very commonly preached story in the church, especially in the American church. It's found in Luke chapter 15, if you've never read it before. But it's about the lost sheep, the parable of the lost sheep. 
And back then in the culture, um, shepherds if, would have like a hundred sheep, which which is what's the reality in this story, is a me- medium to large sized flock. And shepherds will tell you that then and today, the only reason that a sheep would leave the flock, the only reason one would even leave the 99 is because it was hurt. The only reason sheep feel the need to leave the flock and the community that they feel like they belong as if they're hurt, and only because they don't want the rest of the flock to get attacked, because they know that they're going to get attacked. And so the story that we preach a lot of the time, we even take out a context and make it about something that's actually not. Like, the sheep is leaving because it's hurt, and the way to go after the sheep that's hurt is to go find it, to seek it out, and to bring it back to where it belongs, even though it doesn't know that it belongs there. And so to those who are on the fence about church, who have maybe done damage to church themselves, you have to listen to their narrative from their narrative perspective. You can't try to interject your own opinions and you can't try to justify away the pain. So what I hear you saying is, is having really the skill of being able to, to really listen intuitively, yeah. not to be able to interject or justify, but to be able to allow someone to be able to, to share from their heart, but able to just give them that space to listen so if our listeners said, okay, I, I want to be able to, to be in that position, is there a, stra- a tip or a strategy to really help someone to sit and listen? Because it's not as easy as, as we think it is to listen, right? We like to solve problems. Certainly, yes, um, men love to be able to just solve the problem when we hear it. We're going to give you solutions, right? So what, what's this, what is the secret really to be able to sit and listen? It's to go... It's to meet them where they least expect you to meet them um, and to show up when you maybe you're uninvited, but to literally sit and maybe maybe just physically just sit and listen to what they have to say, but to show up in a way that you're not necessarily planning the event, but you're meeting them exactly where they are in their life. And you're saying, hey, I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. I'm for you. And I just want to listen. I want to be involved in your life. And I want you to know that I'm. I understand, maybe I can empathize, but I understand with your pain, and I want to do something about it. Wow, very interesting. So I, I think that leadership is is influence. I think you would agree with me in, in reference to that statement that leadership is influence. Yeah. What is one top strategy that you like to share with your clients to help them really increase the results around influence? <laughs> um. I think a lot of times we leave influence to people that aren't ourselves. Um, we think that the people that have the titles are the ones that are influential and the people that have the degrees or whatever it may be are the ones that are influential. Um, when really humans at their core are influential beings. Um, and so the going back to the beginning of our conversation, really, the the skill to understanding and realizing exactly how you can increase results on a on a metric scale, on an emotional, mental scale, is starting at the end. What do you want to be true about your life when you can no longer speak for yourself? And because of that, let's let's get you there. Like let's start right now, taking the first step to get to where your the person who's speaking at your funeral isn't having to lie about your life, but you have you have taken control of your life in a sense that you aren't the one. You are the one that's calling the shots and you are in influencing people that you never would have otherwise because the imposter that has said that you aren't enough no longer has the voice that you once given it. Well, I love that and to increase the level of influence because you're right. It doesn't matter if you have the title of leader. I think I, I believe that you can actually lead from the middle, uh, wherever Amen. you are in the organization yeah. that you can lead because it's all based on the one who's influencing. Yep. within the within the group and I love that if you know what the purpose is like we've talked about then you really can lead from a being from an authentic self yes and people don't follow fake people follow authentic yes and so even if you have the title but you're fake they're only going to follow the one who's next in line that's authentic and maybe that person is at the quote unquote bottom of the food chain but because they're authentic they're going to follow yeah i love that that word choice of being authentic. Yes. 
So I believe that success leaves clues. And one of those clues are the authors and books that leaders read. So what are some authors or books that have influenced you in your, in your business? Whew. Um, I love Jordan Peterson, uh, 12 Rules for Life. I'm a huge fan of. Um, Donald Miller is one of my key mentors. Donald Miller started Story Brand, which basically is the idea of everything is story, everything is narrative. And so the way to market or the way to run your organization is through a story, um, is, is through that idea. Um, and so those two guys in particular, I would say, I read like five or six books at a time, so it's it's hard to oh my goodness. like rack my brain and think about what books because every book that I read has at least one gold nugget. If you know what I mean, like they're they're, they're I don't finish a bad book. We'll put it that way. Yeah. Um, but those two guys come to the top of my mind because Jordan Peterson's a guy that's very based on intentionality. Um, and Donald Miller is a guy that's very based on story. And that's really the collaboration of those two things is really where I feel like I enter the grand narrative of life and say, what, what can we do about this? Yeah, those are great. I'm not familiar. I don't think of the, the 12 rules for life. I need to add that to my list, but the stories is really important because we, we think and process, right? In stories, but it's so, it's not a skill that most of us aren't natural to be able to to tell our story to make an impact. Yeah. So thank you for that suggestion. So reading five books, you read them all like uh, throughout the month or throughout the year, or is it just random within the like adding books to your? I like to finish a book a week. That's oh my, normally that's awesome. My my hope is to finish a book a week, and I normally start all five books at the same time, but one is like. I'm in the fast lane with and I want to get through this because it's hitting me right where I need it to hit me. And so that's the book that I, I'll go to and then I'll go to the next one and so on and so forth. But they're normally in different genres and different um, mental spaces. And so it's not all leadership or not all Christianity or not all fiction. It's all it's a collaboration of the three so that my brain can digest and operate and not have to read the same type of material uh, in, in the same form for four different books, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's great. And for those listeners out there that uh, are thinking, I can't even get through a book a month, more or less than <laughs> you know five books. Um, just recommend you just to pick up the you know your the next book that, yeah. that maybe the ones that re- that um, Lathan recommended, but something that that you can read at least fifteen minutes a day to yes. get that habit started. Or if you don't like reading and you don't want to fit it in, there's always Audible, right, to be able to to listen to book. Yep. Why you drive? Books on the go. Exactly. So, um, what does the future hold for you? Are you working on any special projects? Well, the one thing that I'm working on, I used to be a pastor, and so one thing that I'm working on as a long term vision is a what if we viewed the church, capital C church, not just the local church, what if we the, the whole church through the eyes of a stripper? Because I think that. Um, a lot of churches would would say and would, would say from the platform, and I think that's where some of the hurt comes from. They'd say from the platform that they everybody belongs, but if somebody like a stripper walked into your church, they automatically wouldn't belong, and they and they'd feel that. And so churches operate, unfortunately, more like a country club, club and less like a community center. And I think all churches, I think all organizations, really, um, and not just churches, but every organization should operate as a community center. We want to be a place that's for people. We want we want people to be champions here. And so, what does future hold for me? And man, I hope I hope more story. I hope more conversations. I hope I meet more people. Um, and unfortunately, it's just it's just the, the numbers of people that have the imposter um, just reaming down their neck are are millions. Um, and so, I know that they're out there. But I hope the future holds for me day by day and more stories. And we start planning more funerals. In the sense of saying, hey, let's change where we are right now so we can get to where we want to be when we can't be anymore. Um, and so those that that first of faithful is what it's called is how to how churches can view their services through the eyes of somebody that they that Jesus interacted with um, and less religious, if you will. Um, but that's all categorized even still with the black sheep. So I really want to hear more stories of gold from black sheep. 
Wow, that's awesome. So if our, our listeners wanted to connect, which I know they will, what's the best way for them to be able to reach out? LathanCraft.com is my website. Um, madeforpurpose.us or .us is what you and I talked about a lot. That's that's active right now. You can go to the website. You can email me. But LathanCraft.com has a link to everything that I'm doing, podcasts, books, all that stuff is on my website. Okay, perfect. I'll make sure all those links are in the show notes as well. Or near the man. Yeah. Hey, well, thank you again for sharing all your strategies and tips, helping our listeners to break through their obstacles, build resilience, and achieve success. Every obstacle is an opportunity. I was grateful yeah. for the conversation. Exactly. Well, until next time, this is your host, Warren Wandling, saying, be resilient.